Well, thank you very much. So I would like to start by thanking the organizers. So it's a huge pleasure and honor to be here, given this set of lectures. So I will be talking about the conformal bootstrap. Um, feel free to stop me at any time, and uh, I will hopefully leave some time at the end of the talk for, uh, of the lectures for questions. But please, feel free to stop me at any time. So what will these lectures be about? So the conformal bootstrap is basically a technique to study conformal field theories in general d-dimensions. Now, why? So one can ask different questions. The first question we need to ask is why it is interesting to study conformal field theories. So why would anyone care about conformal field theories? Now, the, the reason, there are many reasons to study conformal field theories. On one hand, they are, is the font large enough? This one, yeah? It, tell me, please, if it isn't. So the first reason to study conformal field theories is that they are very relevant for physics. They arise, for instance, in the asymptotic regimes of quantum field theories, in condensed matter, the description of critical points, etc. They also have a very beautiful interplay with mathematics. through representation theory, the Langlands program, etc. Many interesting theories are conformal. And we have heard already conformal field theories mentioned in this, uh, in this school. So we have N equals 4 super Yanni Mills, which is the main theory for the DSCFT duality. Um, then we have the Ising model, critical O-N models mentioned by, by David Gross, and a lot of theories that are relevant for all what we do are actually conformal theories. And more generally, they appear everywhere in a string theory, in dualities, in a string theory, and gauge theories. So for all these reasons, it is actually quite important, and there is a lot of people whose purpose in life, well, purpose at least in physics life, is to study conformal field theories. However, there is a little problem, and is that conformal field theories in d dimensions are hard. And the reason why, are hard, why they are hard, so I will mention some of the reasons, is on one hand, conformal field theories do not have, generally, they don't have a Lagrangian description. Now, if you have a theory with a Lagrangian description and your advisor asks you to compute some observable in that theory, in principle, I am not saying that's, that's something easy to do, but in principle, you can compute that, that observable as a function of the coupling constant by doing a perturbation, a Taylor expansion around small values of this coupling constant. And then there is a systematic way given, given, given by Feynman diagrams to compute A0, A1, A2, etc. Now, this is not very satisfactory 
So, on one hand, conformal field theories mostly don't even have a Lagrangian, don't even have such a small parameter. But even for theories that do have a Lagrangian, sometimes we miss a lot of things by just doing a perturbative computation. So, on one hand, this becomes very complicated very quickly, and in some of the most studied theories of, uh, of all times, this even A1 is actually very hard to compute for some observables. But furthermore, much of the physics, as you have seen, for instance, in David Gross or the lecture by Nati Cyber yesterday, much of the physics is actually non-perturbative. So, this is the first, reason, the first reason why to study conformal field theories is quite hard. They usually don't have an a Lagrangian. The second reason is that in D bigger than 2, we don't have some of the luxuries. of t equals 2. Sometimes, I, am, I apologize, I will abbreviate some English words. This is, the reason is twofold. I am very slow writing, and I usually don't know the spelling of many words. So that's a <laughs> very convenient thing to do. But in two dimensions, you have a lot of nice things. You have Virasoro. Symmetry. You have many models, like conf rational conformal field theories where you have a finite number of primaries. And in general, in two dimensions, representation theory is very powerful. All this doesn't happen in higher dimensions. So, in higher dimensions, we need to do something else. So, and, and this is basically the idea of the conformal bootstrap. So, the idea of these lectures, the idea of the conformal bootstrap, is to resort, to try to do computations by resorting only to symmetries and consistency conditions. I will be much more specific along the lectures of what I precisely mean by these consistency conditions. In particular, we will not assume the existence of a Lagrangian in our method. We will not assume the theory, for most part, we will not assume the theory is weakly coupled, we will not assume supersymmetry, we will not assume integrability. And because of that, the range of applicability of the things we will do will be very wide. And they will apply basically to every conformal field theory. So, this seems to be a beautiful idea, but it's somehow, it, it looks like useless, right? Unless I give you more meat, more content to this. Now, this idea, so just to give you some idea, the idea to try to do computations in conformal field theory by using consistency conditions was applied successfully to two dimensions in the 80s oops sorry and then 
It took many years, but finally, in 2008, it was implemented in higher dimensions. Now, this uh, implementation by Rishkov and collaborator was the starting point of a numerical program, kind of a numerical revolution, which is somehow still going on, thanks to the fact that the range of applicability is, is, uh, is actually huge. In parallel, over the last years especially, people have managed to do analytic progress. It is, the, as you will see, the methods that are used in the analytic program or the numeric program are actually quite different to each other, although the spirit is the same. It's always the idea is to resort only to symmetries and consistency conditions. Now, the purpose of these lectures will be to review these developments here. I will pay special attention to the analytic part of, uh, of all this business. And the, my, my, my plan was to try to do a self-contained mini-course to teach you some of the ideas and the techniques behind the Bootstrap program, rather than having a thorough review. So I may leave some important papers, interesting developments outside, but I just wanted to do a very nice self-contained mini-course, after which you will be able to compute things. So, so that's my aim. And please, as I said before, stop me at any time if anything is not clear. So let me write down the plan and then I will take questions if there is any question. So for today, we will see the basics of conformal field theories just to make the course self contained. And then we will end up with the bootstrap equation, which I will call the bootstrap equation. So this will be basically lecture one. And then we will proceed in lecture two to give the idea, very briefly, maybe half an hour, of the numerical bootstrap. So this will be part of lecture two, and the idea, just to see what is the difference, of the analytic bootstrap. Also in lecture two. Then in lecture three, we will continue our study of, of the analytic bootstrap in something which uh, is uh, denoted by large spin perturbation theory, it will be more clear what it is in lecture three. So this is about the analytic bootstrap and related things. And then in the lecture four, we will actually solve some conformal field theories, some real conformal field theories by the analytic bootstrap. So. This is the plan of the lectures. Please feel free to stop me at any time, and we'll be very happy to, to answer questions during the talk, after the talk, etc. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Sorry, yes. It's, uh, sorry about that, yeah. It's, well, I can tell. Large spin perturbation theory. Thank you. It's, uh, I don't know if it is a very good name, but it's a name. It's, uh, I wrote a paper with this name 
something like three years ago, and a collaborator decided that it was really a bad title, so I couldn't. So I did something else later, and I chose that title, but I just wanted to use that title somewhere. <laughs> Any other questions? Good. So this lecture will be basically the basics of conformal field theory. So I want the things to be very clear. So if something is not clear, please stop me. If some of you get bored by this, I sorry, I am sorry, but it is, um, the idea was to make the course self-contained. So I, I will basically review the basics of, of conformal field theory. Is that okay? So, the first point is regarding the symmetry of conformal field theories. All conformal field theories share the conformal algebra. The conformal algebra is generated by the elements first of the Poincaré algebra and this is given by translations P mu and Lorentz rotations M mu nu. So a conformal field theory is translation invariant if you shift everything by one meter then, or one mile, I don't know which units you use here, but then everything is invariant. And if you rotate your system, everything is invariant as well. In addition, we have a scale transformations which are generated by the dilatation operator D. So, if you make your theory twice as big or half as small, the physics is the same. And in addition, we will assume the theory has also, is also invariant under special conformal transformations. K mu. I will not attempt to do this with my hands, so it's, uh, it's just something that is called k-mu. Here, the Lorentz indices mu go between 1 and the number of dimensions d. These generators, they, they satisfy some commutation relations. I just write a few of them, just the simplest ones. So, for instance, if you have D with P mu, this is P mu. Then D with K mu is equal to minus K mu. And P mu with K mu, for instance, is K mu with P mu is eta mu nu d minus i n mu nu. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Now, of course, if you are considering a specific conformal field theory, a specific conformal field theories may have extra symmetries, but we want to keep the discussion as general as possible, and we want our results to apply to all conformal field theories. So this is the only thing we will assume. So the only thing we assume is that the theory has conformal symmetry. And we see, let's see how far can we get with this. Then if you are considering specific theories, you can have more results, and that's good. But, uh, but for the moment, we will apply our discussion completely general. Is that okay? Is that clear? Good. Then, this is the conformal algebra. It 
is a set of conformal primary. I will define what I mean by that. Conformal primary local operators. And we will denote these conformal primary local operators by some O, like this. And they will be labeled by two indices, delta and L, and they are functions of the point of space, O, delta L, X. These operators are eigenfunctions of the dilatation operator, and this delta is the eigenvalue with respect to the dilatation operator. So this delta here is called the, sometimes the scaling or simply the dimension. Scaling dimension. And it's the eigenvalue with respect to the dilatation operator. On the other hand, these operators have also a Lorentz spin, and I denote that representation by L. Another fancy way of saying this thing is that representations of the conformal algebra are labeled by these two numbers. And so these operators, they have uh, this, this label. Is that OK? So in addition, the fact that they are primaries in, in rigorously means I will give another characterization in a second. But the fact that they are primaries means that if you take them and you act, if you take them at the origin, and you act them with the special conformal transformations, then you annihilate them. So this is the definition of primary. Now, notice the following. Notice that there is a very nice analogy between, so how do you need to think of these primary operators So we can start exactly as Nima by thinking about the harmonic oscillator. And notice that in the harmonic oscillator, you can construct creation and annihilation operators. And they are such that the commutation of the Hamiltonian with A plus is basically a, a dagger. And the commutation with A is minus A. So these two commutation relations look exactly as these two commutation relations with P and K. And recall that for the harmonic oscillator, you have a ground state. And the property of this ground state is that if you act, well, I could have called it zero anyway. I mean, that if you act with the annihilation operator, then you get zero. This is exactly the same here. So these conformal primary operators, they have the same interpretation as the ground states of the harmonic oscillator, but in conformal field theories, there are many of them. And they are labeled by delta and L. Yeah, is that OK? Now, exactly as for the annihilation, of, as, the, as for the harmonic oscillator, you can Given a primary, you also have descendants of that primary. Also, sorry about that. It's uh, not very nice. So let, let me write here. So given a primary, you have also descendants. And basically, these descendants 
are obtained by acting. with translations on the primary operator. This, by the way, is equivalent to acting with derivatives. So, this is exactly the same as for the harmonic oscillator. Given the ground state, you can act with the creation operator which for conformal field theories is the translations P mu. Notice that D with P mu is equal to P mu. Is that okay? Is that clear? Good. A nicer, a easier way, if you are given, let's say someone stops you in the street, gives you some operator and asks you whether it's a primary or not. If it is the derivative of something else, it's not a primary. If it is not, it is a primary. So that's an easy way. But sometimes it's hard to see. Is that okay? Excellent. So, a very nice property of conformal field theories, which is a property... Yeah? You can ask. Sorry. So here is P... Sorry about that. It's P, so you act with P mu 1, P mu 2, P mu k. And uh, this is the same as D mu 1, dot, 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 D mu k, basically. And any other questions? Good. So we have this bunch of conformal primary operators labeled by delta and L. And uh, good, I didn't know if the clock was going in one direction or the other. Oh, that's very useful. And, and then, a very nice property of conformal field theories, which will be very important for us. Yeah, you know like this. Form an algebra. This algebra is very important. We will call it the operator product expansion, or simply OPE. And what this algebra says, more specifically, I will write large so people on the, on the right can see this, is that if you have a local operator, local primary operator like this, or i at x, and you put it together, O0, O at 0, J, and here by I and J, I just denote a generic primary operator. So this I is just a shortcut notation for delta I and Li, then this product can be expressed as an infinite sum of local operators on the right. Can you see there? Is that okay? Yeah? So since the OP is quite important, so if you cannot see, please let me know. So here you get a sum over k, where this k denotes primary operators. And here we have some coefficient, which is denoted by C, I, J, K. There is some scale due to scale invariance, delta K minus delta I minus delta J. And here, on the right-hand side, we can have on one hand, we have primary operators, so we will denote this generic primary operator by O, K at zero. But in addition, we can have also the descendants of this operator. So for instance, the first descendant here is 
x mu d mu ok 0 plus terms with two derivatives terms with three derivatives and so on is that okay what is very important about this formula here, this also you can have in, in a quantum field theory, you could also write something like this, but what is important in a conformal field theory is that the coefficient of the descendants is fixed by conformal symmetry. This is actually quite remarkable. We will see how powerful that is. So this has to be a one or whatever it is, but it has to be something fixed. And this is a consequence of conformal symmetry. And the next one also has to be fixed, and so on and so forth. Is that okay? Yeah? Any? This is true in any dimensions, but... So this statement is true in any dimensions. What these precise coefficients are may depend on these deltas and the number of dimensions. So, yeah, so I, I can tell you precisely, uh, so for this to be true, the full conformal symmetry is actually necessary. So for, for this scaling, this scaling, like in, in, a quant, in a quantum field theory, you can, so in a conformal field theory, there are two important improvements with respect to a quantum field theory. One that is obvious, from what I wrote, and the other, which is not at all obvious from what I wrote. What is more or less obvious from what I wrote is that in a general conformal field theory, the form of this is actually nastier than that. This, for instance, in order to fix this behavior with x, you need dilatations, you need to act with dilatations. And then, in order to fix this coefficient here, you need to act with a special conformal transformations, so you need that. There is a more conceptual question, and it's the question of whether this series converges. And the true statement in a conformal field theory is, again, this, take, this is a little complicated, but basically the convergence properties of these are much better in a conformal field theory than in a quantum field theory. In a quantum field theory, more or less, intuitively, you really need x to be very close to zero for this to work. In a conformal field theory, actually, this series converges, and the precise statement is that if you are considering a correlation function with many local operators, and you take two local operators, and you can you can build a sphere with these two guys and no other operator, then this converges. So it's, it converges in a much better way than in a quantum field theory. So in a conformal field theory, this is much more powerful than in a quantum field theory. Is that okay? Does it answer the question? Any other question? Yes. <laughs> Yes. We will that do that in one second. That's an excellent question, excellent observation. I will answer that in two seconds. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, I don't want to, but the reason I don't want to is because it will spoil the surprise I have for you in one minute. But, <laughs> sorry. I will in two minutes. So the question is, uh, I, will answer, I will ask the question and answer the question in two minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, but I will repeat the questions in general because I know it's hard to hear them from the back. Good. So 
notice that this CIJK, this, they have the interpretation of the structure constants of the algebra. And these structure constants sometimes are denoted the OPE coefficients. Not a lot of fantasy in this name, but they are just called OPE coefficients. So sometimes I will just call them OPE coefficients, and, and that will be a very convenient name. Now, we see that in this part, in this part, so we have a sum over primaries. And on the right hand side, there are both primary and descendants, but the point is that the coefficients of the descendants are fully fixed in any number of dimensions by conformal symmetry. Notice, so what, ha what has appeared so far in our review of conformal field theories, so two parameters that are important, so are these sets of delta L for all your spectrum of your theory, So the spectrum of the theory is basically the set of all deltas and all spins of all primary operators. And these, together with the OP coefficients for every triplet of operators, IJK, this is what people denotes the CFT data. And we will see in 10, 15 minutes why this is so important. But by CFT data, I just mean the spectrum of the theory, that is the, a list of all the deltas and all the spins of, the, of your theory. And this CIJK for every triplet of primary operators. Is that okay? This is the CFT data. Good. So these are the main ingredients of a conformal field theory. In addition, we want to compute something in a conformal field theory. And the kind of things that we compute are correlators of local operators. So the main observable. Observable are correlators O1, X1, etc., up to ON, Xn. So this is the quantity, the most natural observable in a conformal field theory. It turns out that conformal symmetry is actually quite powerful. And these correlators cannot be anything, but they are very constrained. Their space-time dependence is very constrained by conformal symmetry. So very constrained. They are so constrained that, for instance, and we have seen this today in Nima's lecture, if you consider, unless for a moment, Let's consider scalar operators, so operators with our spin. If you consider the two-point function of two operators, it turns out that this is zero if delta 1 and delta 2 are different, and it's the same well, you can always choose it to be delta ij divided x1, 2 to the 2 delta i if, sorry, uh, here, 1 and 2 are i and j, if delta i is equal to delta j. So, and I have introduced the notation where x12 is x1 
minus x2. So, in a conformal field theory, the two-point function of, of operators has its dependence completely constrained by conformal symmetry, and the dependence with the space, with the distance, is given by this power having this delta i on it. Is that okay? So this is a beautiful result about conformal field theories. Now I can ask the question that I was asked today. The question was whether there was a smart way to do to compute the three-point function. Oops, sorry, this is. So if we have the three-point function, O i x1, ox j, x2, ok, x3, then this is also fixed by conformal symmetry and is c, i, j, k, x1, 2, well, this is a little tedious, but is delta i plus delta j minus delta k. Is this useful for p? It's very small, right? Yeah. Uh, I will write, sorry about that. Um, and let me write this bigger, 1, 3. But whenever I have the distance 1, 3, I have delta i with a plus sign plus delta k because it's the one in the third position, minus delta j, which is the one not there. And then times 1 over x to 3 to the same exponent. Is that okay? Sorry, this is a terrible formula, but you can ask me the, the correct version. Um, now, the question was whether we could deduce this from the OPE, and the answer is absolutely. So notice that you could have said, OK, let's take these two operators here, and let's take the OPE of these two operators here. And then it turns out that the coefficient that appears here, it is exactly the same as the coefficient that appears here. So two and three point functions of conformal field theories, are their space-time dependence is completely fixed, and they are fully written in terms of the dimensions of the operators entering the correlator. And for three-point functions, the OP coefficients of the, of the operators. Is that OK? Yes? Any questions? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in a second, for, for the moment, we don't need to be too precise about whether we are in Euclidean or Minkowski signature. Um, I, I will go back to. I will, will come back to that. Yeah, you can think about all this in Euclidean for now. Any other questions? Good. So, is everything clear so far? More or less clear. So this is a review, more or less. But, uh, but the important point, so we have conformal primary local operators. These operators satisfy the OPE, which is this huge formula here. And the main observable are correlation functions of local operators. And two and three point functions are fixed by the by conformal symmetry. Now, before I go ahead, let, let me let me mention something small, so I, I would have to raise this beautiful formula. We will be dealing mostly with um, with scalar operators, but there is a special non-scalar operator, which is the stress tensor. I will mention. We will not use it too much, but we will return to it. In a, in a second, sorry, in two days, actually. So the stress tensor 
is an operator of a spin 2, T mu nu, and the properties of the stress tensor, the stress tensor has many nice properties. So it is symmetric, it has a spin 2, it is symmetric and traceless. into operator is conserved that means that the mu of the mu nu is equal to zero and correlation functions with the stress tensor they have actually a very nice properties. So for instance, if you consider the two-point function of the stress tensor, t mu nu x with t, let's say, rho sigma y, now the formula is a little bit more complicated than the formula for scalars, simply because we have these four indices, mu, nu, rho, and sigma. But again, conformal field theory fixes the answer of this of the correlator and the the statement is that so what people usually so the convention is that there is a constant here which is called c and this is the central charge and then the denominator is x minus y to the 2d so that the dimension of the stress tensor is always d in d dimensions so the delta is equal to d so this is always true it's a protected quantity it will not get quantum corrections etc and times a structure mu nu rho sigma, which is very cumbersome actually, but, but uh, the, the important point about this is that this is fixed by conformal symmetry. Is that okay? So I am not being very precise, you can go to a book, but the, the important point is that conformal symmetry not only fixes two-point functions of scalar operators, but also fixes two-point functions of operator with dimension, with the spin, sorry, and the most important one is the stress tensor, which always has a spin D. Sorry, dimension D and a spin 2. Another uh, beautiful result is that if you have a scalar operator of dimension delta, another scalar operator of dimension delta, and T mu nu, then this is also fixed and well, just to be uh, also fixed. Now, the, the reason why I, I want to mention uh, I want to mention this, we will use this in the fourth lecture when we will we'll be solving for for uh, yes, sorry. Oh, no, no. I mean, for, for conformal symmetries, this is fully known. It's the whole answer. This is just the whole answer. And, and you don't even need to write down what the mu nu is. The answer actually follows from symmetries. So this is the full answer. It, it's just too long. It would take me the whole blackboard to write what this is, especially with my large font. That's why I am not writing it. But this is fully known and fixed, and it's the full answer. And this is also fully known, and it's the full answer. And notice in particular, yes, so just one more comment, and then I, I, we, we will go back to your question. Now, notice in particular that 
what this fixes is so what will be relevant in the fourth lecture, this is the reason why I am mentioning this, is because you can now, if you have the two-point function and the three-point function, you can have a look at the OP coefficient with which t mu nu appears in the OPE of a scalar operator with itself. And notice that here we have chosen normalizations in which O with O has a numerator which is one, right? And in this normalization, what appears here in the three-point function is the OPE coefficient. We could have done that for the stress tensor, but it's not what people usually does for many other reasons. So if the operator is not properly normalized, what the OPE coefficient is, so the square, if you wish, of the OPE coefficient, phi, phi with t, is O, O, t, divided t with t. Of course, if you are in a normal square, sorry about that. So you see, so this ratio is invariant under normalization of t. If you take t and multiply it by 2, this is still an invariant quantity. And the important point, which we will return to that, is that this is 1 over the central charge. Sorry? Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Is that OK? Sorry, so th this was a little uh, messy. Yes, so this is all the dependence. Uh, so wh what I just wanted to say, <laughs> yeah, this is not, so. Uh, is that okay? Is that a little better? So what I am saying is that in, in the normalization in which O with O, has numerator 1, then what appears in the numerator of O with O with O is actually the OP coefficient. But if here, let's say you multiply O by 2, right? And you choose your normalizations in such a way that here there is a 4, then here you would have an 8, right? So what, what is, if you want to compute the OP coefficient, you need to take this and divide, uh, is that right? Yes, and, and divide to, oh, sorry, yes. But here we have, of course, only one t. Uh, so let's say that, that you just compute, you, you want to, to compute, so, let, let me do the following. Sorry about that. So, this is the OPE with which OK appears in OI, OJ, in a normalization in which OK, OK goes like 1. Is that OK? But of course, if you, will have, if you had a normalization in which you multiply OK by 2, let's say here you have a 2, then this would not, then this would be 2 times 2, or 4, then here you wouldn't have a 1 anymore, you would have a 2, because you have multiplied OK by 2. Is that OK? But then the OPE coefficient, if you have to compute the OPE coefficient, you just take this and divide by the square root of that. And that's independent of the normalization. Sorry? Sorry, sorry? Right. Sorry. I, what I am just saying, imagine that I give you, imagine that you have to compute, imagine that you have to compute the OP, I ask you to compute the OP coefficient, which which T mu nu appears in O delta with O delta, right? 
naively, you would say, here I am not, let's say here there appears a one, right? Naively, you would say that the OPE is just one because this is the formula I wrote on the right-hand side, right? However, in the formula of the right-hand side, we have assumed that the scalar operators are normalized in such a way that O with O is one. But this is not true for T. Sorry, if people could have chosen to normalize T by dividing by the square root of C, right? And here you would have one over the square root of C, the central charge. Sorry, I am being hyper complicated and something is not that important. But we will use that later, sorry about that. But just, so the message is that in a conformal field theory, two-point functions and three-point functions are fixed by conformal symmetry. The formula uh, for two and three-point functions of scalars is like this, but also operators with a spin are fixed by conformal symmetry. Is that okay? Good, yes. Is that, so you mean in which formula? Oh, this, right, that's a very good point. Um, oh, Del, so if I give you a, a CFT, a CFT has a bunch of operators with some given spin and some given delta, right? So I can tell you that there is a conformal field theory which for a spin zero, there is an operator delta, which is 0 0.4. There is another operator whose delta is pi. There is another operator for which delta is a square root of seven. They are like, it is a bunch of real numbers. We don't know what they are. Now, if I give you a specific theory, then in that theory, you may try to compute what this delta is. So, just to give you an example, if you have a free scalar, then phi, then the dimension of this scalar in d dimensions is d minus 2 over 2. It's just a number. Let's say d is equal to 4. This number is equal to 1. If you have phi square, delta of this number in a free theory would be equal to 2. Is that okay? Now, if you have something like delta d mu d nu phi d mu d nu phi, in a free theory, this will have dimension d minus 2 over 2. This also have dimension d minus 2 over 2. This, each derivative has dimension 1, 1. So in a free theory, the dimension of this operator is d minus 2 over 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus d minus 2 over 2. Oh, uh, no, not for the moment. So in, um, in, well, here I have assumed, in order to write down these formulas, I have assumed these are scalar operators. So these operators have no spin. In the operators I just wrote here, this operator is a scalar, this is operator is a scalar, and the operator has a spin too. You can count the number of indices, mu nu. Is that okay? But of course, all this is a free theory. In a conformal field theory, which is interacting, you have no idea what these things are. And they are very hard to compute. But for the moment, we are just thinking that a conformal field theory is characterized by this set of operators, and these operators are labeled by delta and L. And actually, the full bootstrap program is to try to tell you, towards the end, I will try to tell you what these deltas and L can be. So th this is the aim of this course. Is that okay? 
Yeah. Now, we have seen that two-point functions and three-point functions of scalar operators are completely fixed by conformal symmetry. The first quantity, which is non-trivial, is the four-point function of identical scalar operators. So, we will now, we will look at O, x1, O, x2, with some dimension, O, x3, O, x4. So it is important that these operators are all identical. And now, conformal sy symmetry is not powerful enough to completely fix the, the dependence of this. However, it tells us that this can only be a function of u and v, now I will tell what u and v are, times some prefactor x12 to delta o, x34 to delta o. And these u and v are called the conformal cross ratios. So this u is x12 square, x34 square, x13 square, x24 square, and v is x14 square, x23 square, x13 square, x24 square. So, these quantities, u and v, are called conformal invariant cross ratios, and the point, their point, is that they are combinations of x1, x2, x3, and x4, which are invariant under the full, under all conformal transformations. So, conformal invariance doesn't quite fix completely the four-point function, but it helps a lot. It tells us that the four-point function of scalar operators is not a function, let's say you have four dimensions, and you have four coordinates, you would have 16 degrees of freedom. What conformal invariance does for you is kills 14 of them. So it tells you that this is just a function of two variables, u and v, and these are the two variables. Is that okay? Yes. What? what uh, sorry. Let, let me put, put the times, sorry about that, x, 2, 3, delta j plus delta k minus delta i. Sorry. It does. It, it's completely symmetric under exchange of cyclic exchange of i, j, and k, or not cyclic. Is that okay? Now, the idea of, of um, however, so conformal invariance doesn't fix the form of the four-point function, but there is a beautiful thing going on in conformal field theories. In conformal field theories, we can do the following. I didn't want to. Let me not erase this formula for now. What we can do in a conformal field theory is we can now consider the OPE of these two operators and write these two operators as an infinite sum over primary operators. And you can do the same with these two as well, right? If you do this, let me do it pictorially. function, let, let me write it like that, O3, O4. Now, the idea 
is that you get O1 O2 and write it as a sum over intermediate operators labeled by delta and L. So here there will be some operator delta and L. And you do the same with the right hand side. Here I could have chosen another operator delta prime and L prime, but remember that we can choose these operators in such a way that the two-point function is proportional to the delta function. So the delta function makes the operator here and the operator here to be the same. In other words, this allows to make a decomposition, so the four-point function can be decomposed into conformal partial waves. In formulas, what this means is the following. This function here, GUB, can be written, and I will, I will be very clear now, about all these ingredients as a sum over intermediate operators is this sum here each intermediate primary intermediate primary notice that each intermediate primary will be weighted by the square of the OP coefficient between the two external operators, O1 and O2, and this O delta L. One OP coefficient will appear here, and the other OP coefficient will appear here. And then, for each primary, for each primary, we will have this function of U and V. And what this function does, what this function does, so this is our more important function of today, this is called a conformal block. And the conformal block, its purpose is for a given primary labeled by delta and L, it recasts all the contribution of all the descendants of that primary. So in the OPE, remember that we had not only the primaries, but also all the descendants of these primaries. But the important point was that the coefficient of all these descendants was fixed by conformal symmetry. So the contribution for a given primary, the contribution from all the descendants is again fixed by conformal symmetry. Is that okay? So, these conformal blocks are, are a crappy function. I will write some in a second. They are horrible functions. But the important point is that they are completely fixed. by conformal symmetry. Yeah? Absolutely, yes. I will come back to, to in a few minutes to that. That's, uh, the, yeah, that's like the point of today's lecture. I will come back to that, but I want you to sleep well at night. And I knew you wouldn't if you didn't know any conformal block. So if you are curious, I tell you what a conformal block is in four dimensions, just for you to see that this is some nice, close uh, function. You can put it in Mathematica. So for instance, in four dimensions, G delta L. So this is just to show you that this is a fully well-defined function. So I, I will I will 
describe all this for you. Goodness. In a second. And here is K delta plus L over 2 set K delta minus L minus 2 over 2 set bar minus KK with set and set bar exchange. And in this notation, let me be fully precise and clear, K beta is set to the beta 2F1, sorry about that, this is a hypergeometric function, beta, beta, 2 beta, set, almost there, and we have used coordinates in such a way that u is set, set bar, and v is 1 minus set, 1 minus set bar. Horrific, but fully explicit. It's something that you can put in Mathematica, it's something that you can play with. These hypergeometric functions, they are similar to the Bessel functions that Nima was describing today. They have similar properties, and the important point is that these functions are completely fixed by conformal symmetry. Is that okay? I will give you some exercises in lecture two that you will be able to solve by yourselves just by typing this down in Mathematica. You know, typing it down is the hardest thing. Once you have done that and you did it correctly, it, they are really cool to play. And you are like solving real four-dimensional CFTs. So we will do that in a couple of lectures. Now, uh, good. So the comment of today was a, actually a remarkable fact. Note that not only two and three-point functions are explicitly written in terms of the OP coefficients and the spectrum of the theory, the anomalous dimensions. But actually, also the four-point function is fully written in terms of the spectrum of the theory, here, and the OP coefficients. So, if you have the OP coefficients and the spectrum of the theory, in principle, you can write down a four-point function. But actually, you can write down any correlator. Because if you have a 22-point function, you take the first two guys or girls, and then you take the OP among them. You take the other two, OP, 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 etc., until you are left with only two. And then you are done. It's a horrific multiple sum, but in principle, all correlators of conformal field theories can be fully written in terms of the CFT data. And that's the reason why, if you, have, if you are able to compute the CFT data for a conformal field theory, by the way, this was never, has never been done for any non-trivial CFT in dimensions higher than two, so it's a hard problem. But if you do it, you get a prize, because you have solved the CFT. You can hang it out in your room or whatever, and you are happy for life. Is that okay? So that's why people are so interested in computing the CFT data, because that really gives you the solution of a CFT. Of course, if you, are, if you, if you have a, a general conformal field theory, this CFT data can be a horrific function of the parameters of your theory. If you have coupling constants, you could try to compute them by doing some perturbative expansions, but they are really horrible. So this is, is nothing easy. It's actually quite complicated. So the idea of the conformal bootstrap is rather than computing them, is to try to determine consistency conditions that this CFT data should have. Can this delta and L's and these OP coefficients, can they be anything? And the answer is actually no. They cannot be anything. And now, notice that we have done a lot of trivial things. We will do one more trivial thing, and we will write down a highly non-trivial equation. So bear with me. 
I need, yeah, maybe like 10 minutes. Is that okay? I don't know whom to ask. So I will assume it is okay. Yes. It's, uh, now, the bootstrap approach to this question. So you could go and compute. And actually, there is people who, after 20 years, 20 years, they compute the CFT data to three levels. And even to one loop, in the most studied theory, which is, let's say, n equals 4 super Yanni Mills, this is not known for all operators. So this is a hard problem. But if you solve it, you have the f interacting CFTs. So it's a really cool problem. The bootstrap approach is a little bit different. The bootstrap approach tells the following. And let's, let me, uh, I think, I'm not sure what to erase. I, I can erase here. If this is going to define a consistent conformal field theory, if this conformal field theory is nice and, con and consistent, then it means that a four-point function, let's look at the fingers, my tips of my fingers, sorry. Then if you exchange two of the tips, the four-point function should be the same. If you are considering a four-point function of four identical operators, this four-point function should be crossing symmetric. In particular, if here you exchange one and three, you should get the same result. But this implies that this GUB, whatever it is, it should satisfy So just remember, let's say that you exchange x1 with x3. Here, the, the, the denominator will also change. And you can check that this change exchanges u with b. I will write down the final equation, it will be big, be u, and the same with 1 and 3 exchange. So it's 2, 3, or 2, 3, 2 delta O times x1, 4, 2 delta O. But in particular, this implies v to the delta O, gub, is equal to u to the delta o g b u. OK. I mean, I am sure you can think of a lot of symmetric functions of u and b, right? So this equation doesn't look too powerful by itself. However, we will combine this. We will try to combine this equation. This is our crossing equation. Look at it, memorize it. We will use it a lot. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. So this is pretty general. It's just both a symmetry of a correlator of four identical particles. Now, in order to maximize the visual impact of what I will write down, let me do one small trick. And the small trick here is the following. This is just, just I don't know, it's just a, a little cuter to do like that. So we will now write down the OP, the conformal block decomposition. And it is sometimes customary to single out the identity operator. So the first operator that appears in the OPE is actually the identity operator. And this identity operator has OP coefficient equals 1. This is very easy to see because I forgot that if you put OK equals 1 here, you just get back to the two-point function, basically. And it doesn't have any descendants because the derivative of 1 is 0. So the contribution of the identity is just 1. But now, let's try. Look at this equation here. 
And in this equation here, we plug this decomposition here. Yeah? We can use Mathematica, if you wish. What this leads to is to the following, and I just need to write down two equations, and I am done. So in terms of OP decomposition, sometimes also you will see the following statement. You will see that the decomposition along this channel is the same as the decomposition along the other channel. This is equivalent to the equation I am going to write. I just take this equation and I plug this, the composition here. And what this implies is that V to the delta O, 1 plus sum over delta L, C delta L square G delta L UV is equal to U to the delta O. I will write down two equivalent equations. 1 plus sum over delta L C delta L square G delta L, but now of V and U. Just by plugging this decomposition into that crossing equation is is uh, fairly straightforward, and all these can be rearranged, and then this will be the very last equation I will write down. So we will go back to this equation to this form in the analytic bootstrap, but let me write it in another way: sum over delta L of C delta L square. V to the delta O, G delta L, UV minus U delta O, G delta L, VU divided by U to the delta O minus V to the delta O is equal to Now, this is an absolutely remarkable equation. What we are saying is that no matter what the spectrum of your theory is, no matter what the sum is over, no matter what the OPE coefficients are, if inside here you put down this expression for the conformal blocks, which is a completely ugly equation, this combination has to be exactly one for all values of u and v. So if you are in the street, let's say Buenos Aires, and you find someone with a knife, and he hands you a list of a spectrum and OP coefficients and ask you, does this define a consistent CFT? Then what you have to do, you have to take this input, you plug it into this equation, and you see if the right-hand side is exactly one. This is highly non-trivial. And notice that we haven't done any computation, right? I mean, we were just assuming very general things, all this applies to any conformal field theory in any number of dimensions. And whatever the spectrum and OP coefficients are, they have to satisfy this equation here. In the rest of these lectures, we will learn how to extract information from this equation. Notice that it's conceptually quite simple, actually. And we will do so very briefly numerically, to see what numerical people does, and then we will try to extract analytic information about it. This is the end. Are there any questions? Yes. So thank you. Anyway.
So if you have two primary operators that have the same scaling dimension, then um, you are not, you shouldn't be just summing over just one propagator, right? That's absolutely brilliant comment, indeed. I mean, in principle, here if you have the generate operators, operators with the same anomalous with the same dimension and the same spin, then here you should sum over this species as well. Yeah. It, all what we have said is, is exactly equivalent. Here, you should sum over all intermediate states. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry? That's a very good question. So, uh, I, I tell you what is believed to happen. What it is believed is that here, of course, we took one very specific operator and we consider the four-point function of that operator. But in principle, you could consider all four-point functions of all operators. It is believed that if all four-point functions of all operators are crossing symmetric, then the CFT is consistent. And I think, but this has not been proven, that the same statement is true I discussed this with David Gross. If you consider any endpoint function of the same operator too. So yes, it can constrain the CFT more. But if you consider all four point functions, that's also enough. Uh, I think uh, I, towards the end of, of is, is, um, people have tried to find these solutions and, and uh, you will see how hard it is. And you will see how actually constraining it is. So I, I think it's just the fact that people has, has, has done, has tried, they have tried to do this program and they have seen that if you consider several four point correlators and just four point correlators, uh, then, um, I mean, sorry, from an algebraic point of view, by the way, this is something I didn't want to get in. But actually, crossing symmetry of four-point function is the same as associativity of the OPE algebra. And once you have already explored all the OPE coefficients that can appear, and you have established associativity, that's it. Because the OPE, structure of the OPE, will already automatically imply that all higher point functions will also be uh, fine. So yeah, I guess that's the answer. In two dimensions, yeah, there is a lot of things you can do in two dimensions. And yes, in two dimensions, this has been established. And the, the structure of the OP. But, but in higher dimensions, what people strongly be believe is true. But I am not sure if there is a mathematical proof. I don't think there is. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, that's another point. So here, we are studying the four-point function in flat space. It is also not absolutely clear that when you will study this conformal field theory, not in flat space, that, that will still satisfy a, a consistent conformal field theory. Indeed, in two dimensions, you have to study them in the torus, and then, um, uh, yeah, and then you have modular invariance as well. Yeah. So but, it's not known what is the analog of that in higher dimensions? No, it's an excellent question, actually. I see. So lines just points to points in two dimensions, go over to line. I see. Yeah, but it would take out, out of this family. Yeah, you can study correlators also. Sorry, sorry? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's true, yeah. But you could also try to study four-dimensional, let's say, conformal field theories, not in curve, in curve space, and try to work out crossing there, etc. And that hasn't been done. But yeah, that, that, that would be. Yes. <laughs> Let me just ask the question again. So, so let's say we're looking at um, 
Uh, well, here we're talking about all identical operators. I guess if we yeah. go to the opposite extreme and just look at all different, uh, just O one, O two, O three, O four, yes. totally generally, then there's still a crossing equation. Absolutely. And but now, the fact that there's a square here and so on isn't there. So, um, uh, so in, in in what sense are, are were you were you saying that it, just solving the crossing equation in general for general operators is believed to be enough, or that this is believed to be enough? In other words. Uh, um, the, 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 the constraints that come from the sub subset of things that I guess are the most generally of the form A, B, A, B, right? Yes. Uh, um, uh, those are the things where there's some positivity involved. Absolutely. And, and, Does uh, it believe that that's enough to guarantee the crossing of uh, A, B, C, D in total generality where there's no positivity? Yeah. In, in examples, I think that one example where people have done this exercise and, and they think that it is enough is in the icing model, and indeed I think the only thing they consider are, are operators of, of the form you are saying. So there, there are these two operators. So they are operators epsilon and sigma, and they consider four-point functions with epsilon and sigma. And in that case, it does look like, if you study these crossing equations, etc., then you are left with very tiny islands. And it seems that that already fixes the form of operators A, B, C, D, etc. However, I don't know of any proof that tells that if you study A, A, B, B, that implies A, B, C, D. I, I don't know of any proof. Yeah. I, I, I would be a little surprised too. But somehow, sometimes in this business, you do get a lot of surprising results. And you understand them later. In a slightly different way, maybe. That suppose you have a uh, Z2 symmetry. Yes. So you can only keep the operators which are Z2 invariant and throw everything which is Z2 non-invariant. Yes. It will satisfy all these crossing equations, right? Yes. I mean, in two dimensions, the modular invariance will tell us that you have to also include the Z2 non-invariant operator, like the sigma of the icing model. Mm -hmm. Is there an analog of that in this case? Um, let's see. So, so you, you say that you start with the... Uh... I, I, I understand. I can rephrase the question and answer, if I may. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so he started... The question, if I understand correctly, is a system that has a global Z2 symmetry, and you want to do the overfold, namely consider only the Z2 invariant states. And in two dimensions, the statement is that if you do that, you have two options. Either go back to the theory you started with, or a, go, add more twisted sector states and find a new theory, which is the overfold. And if the symmetry is not Z2, but more complicated, you can actually do that in more than one way. And this is known as discrete torsion. Mm -hmm. If I understand the question correct, correctly, start with a four-dimensional theory, which has a discrete symmetry, for example, Z2. Limit attention to just the Z2 invariant states. All your equations will be satisfied. Where do we see the need to add more operators. Is this the question? Okay, so what I said earlier actually answers precisely that. If you, the fact that you restrict attention to the Z2 invariant states means that you couple the system to a Z2 gauge theory. And you keep only the Z2 invariant operators, which are the gauge invariant ones. If you have a Z2 gauge theory in four dimensions, there are new observables, there are lines, right. which are the Wilson lines, of the Z2 gauge theory. And there are also surfaces which are characterized by the holonomy around them being the non-trivial Z2 or uh, the non-trivial Z2 element. And if you read the twist fields in the two-dimensional problem are the analog of these surfaces that I have just mentioned. They are characterized by, by a Z2 holonomy as you take a, as you go a, around them. This is what the, the Z2 fields do. And again, an easy way to see that is to compactify the four-dimensional theory to two dimensions, and then these surfaces just wrap this two-dimensional surface you compactified on, and so these surfaces will become point-like in two dimensions, and then it connects to the other picture. If you are doing bootstrap, if you are doing bootstrap, is there any way to discover these new operators that you have done something wrong? It's not something wrong. You will have to study the theory 
with the other surfaces. So you did not include all the operators in the theory. And the complete list of operators are the local operators that you included right. correctly. But since you have, you have fewer point-like operators, you must include more surface operators, all those that would have been inconsistent had we not projected out the non-invariant states. So you will not see it from this construction. You will have to do something more subtle to realize that there are more surface operators. Right. So, so indeed. So in particular, notice that here we are just considering correlators of local operators. You can consider more um, non-local observables in this theory too. And I don't know of any theorem that tells that if, the, if all correlations are known, I told you that you would get a price. But there is a question whether, if you have all correlators of local operators in a CFT, whether you can compute all these expectation values of non-local operators as well. I don't think you can. And probably this is one way to see that. And uh, of course, if you have a C2 symmetry, also the, OP, the OPE will have to be consistent with that, uh, with, that OP, or with that C2 symmetry. So you will never get outside from that sector if you just study local operators you would have to study non-local operators. But that's, yeah, well beyond my scope here. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, so for, again, I am not discussing line operators, but, uh, but you, could, you could study, uh, like, uh, what, what people, um, so what, what people have studied is what happens if you have um, if you have these line operators, etc., and what happens when these line operators cross each other. And you can, for instance, study the commutator of these two lines operators, and you can see that they don't actually commute, but there is some effect in them crossing each other, but that's something known. And, but before that, I would even have to tell you what are the constraints on crossing symmetry if you have the correlation of, of lines, etc. So th th this is, uh, is, is um, again, some work has been done, but yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, you can, th there is two issues. There is the issue of, of, of uh, th this expression in terms of some function of U and B this will be a little different. So you, would, you can consider vacuum expectation values of some Wilson loop, but people have also considered this Wilson loop, which is basically a line, let's say, with an operator at x. And you can see the constraints for crossing symmetry with that. And there is also a concept of an OPE decomposition, where instead of having two local operators, you have basically a Wilson loop. And, uh, yeah, but here the concept is a little bit different. For instance, if you have a Wilson loop, the, que the idea is that this Wilson loop, you can also write it as an infinite sum of local operators, basically. And combining all these things, maybe one can do something. But uh, yeah, this is hard enough for me. But, uh. I had in mind the hygiene stuff. Okay. Um, they look very much the same uh, in some context. Um, I, I would have to see what, what is the precise relation. Is uh, yeah. Notice, notice, by the way, that if if uh, so, it's it's not quite what you have asked but I, I want to add it anyway, that in, there we will be studying sometimes conformal field theories with marginal deformations, and they have some coupling constant. And, and the, this will have to be satisfied for all values of these coupling constants. So th th this is quite powerful. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so f I don't know. I mean, so far, uh, at least in higher dimensions, it, the two things have been quite disconnected. And, and what happens 
is that you get you get constraints. So what what happens if you consider this sort of this? Well, okay. So there is an easy answer and there is a complicated answer. So what happens in many cases is that the constraints that you get from this sort of equations they have to be true in in the whole conformal manifold. But it can also happen that these constraints they depend. You see that these constraints depend non-trivially in the dimension of the external operators. So sometimes you can trade the dependence in, in tau, let's say that this is the coordinate of your conformal manifold, by, the de by delta O, and then you can change this delta O, and you can get different constraints along the conformal manifold. But this hasn't been done. But in principle, you, you could try to explore the conformal manifold in that way. The problem with this is that to study this is actually quite hard. And in interesting examples, let's say n equals 4 super n mills would be an ideal example to do what you are proposing. But the only crossing equation which is known and nice is for a protected operator. So actually, delta O is 2 all the time. So you cannot explore the conformal manifold. But if you manage to do this crossing equation efficiently for a non-protected operator, like the Konishi operator, then you could explore the conformal manifold. But that is hard. But it's a good idea, actually. OK. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank Alde.